what companies have said is perhaps we'll step away until the biology is better understood and we can feel like we're targeting things better. And that's why I think the basic understanding of the molecular biology and the genetics, um, as, as well as understanding the circuitry of the brain and how, th how those connections are made and how those processes are really working at a molecular level is going to be so important for the industry then to be able to say, okay, now we know why we would test a particular drug or design a particular drug in a particular way. In recent years, there has been increased awareness about the impact of brain disorders on people living with these conditions, on their families and caregivers, on the economy, and on society. And while we hear mostly about the major neurological disorders such as multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, ALS, and of course Alzheimer's disease and related diseases as our population ages, more recently, we're hearing about traumatic brain injury and the range of mental illnesses, including depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and schizophrenia. But in fact, there are about 1,000 diseases of the brain. And many of them share common underlying mechanisms and are all part of this one system of the brain. It is estimated that about 1 billion people around the world will be directly impacted at some point in their lives. And I think this number is likely greater because of the underreporting for mental illnesses, for example. Mm -hmm. The number is even greater when you consider the indirect impact on people who are living or supporting somebody with a brain disorder. Brain disorders carry an economic burden that is greater than cancer and cardiovascular disease combined. They are the leading cause of disability and may cause both the person living with the disorder and their caregiver to leave the workforce. But funding for research to understand the brain and to develop better treatments, diagnoses, preventative measures, and eventually cures, as well as funding to understand the whole brain, has historically lagged behind investments in other disease areas. Well, that situation is changing. Without doubt, the biggest game changer has been technology. Today, we are improving our ability to image and to operate on the brain to map, record, and modulate neural activity, to collect, store, and share massive data sets. All of these are enablers that will propel the field forward. Because science advances are not just about more money, but about developing the technologies and the approaches that will allow us to get to the next level of understanding. And we need to ensure that we appropriately invest at all stages of the process, from basic discovery research to the translation of discoveries into useful products and services to their application to people with brain disorders. Understanding the brain in its entirety will revolutionize human health and practice. And it will also impact other areas, such as computer design and technology, robotics, law, and education. But we also have to consider the ethical implications, as advances in understanding the brain allow us not to just repair a damaged brain, but to enhance a healthy one. The potential power that we will gain from understanding the brain and the inherent challenges that this endeavor will result in are what we are here to discuss today. So I was on the original working group that set the, uh, that wrote the, the position paper that basically set the agenda for the NIH funding for the, or part of the brain initiative. And I think there are two things I want to say about that. First of all, we spent a fair bit of time at the onset talking about the advantages of big science versus small science. And there were some early voices um, who, or people who argued that we should try and pick one single big project and put all the money in a big project. And after a lot of discussion, we collectively all unanimously agreed that we would be better served to capitalize on the imagination and creativity of the sort of entire community by, by looking for a number of small investigator initiated, you know, bottom up projects. And that is what the NIH had, did decide to do. That is what they did do. And there now have been two, um, calls for proposals that have been funded. Those, a large number of proposals came in. Um, the first round was funded a year ago. The second round was just recently funded. And just to skip ahead, I would just like to say 
that at the last Society for Neuroscience meeting, there was a fabulous symposium um, where four of the first awardees reported back on the results of their first year of, um, of funding. And these were four of the most exciting, sort of spectacular, stunning talks I've ever heard. And there were young people in the audience and you could see their eyes light up. So I think that was the most important decision that we made as, if you will, as a, as a country, which is to, at least at the NIH, to put the money into individual, bottom-up, investigator-initiated proposals. Okay. And I'd like to ask the others to perhaps jump in because one of the comments that we frequently hear is that we are investing in large initiatives and we have to think about the whole process from basic science right through developing technologies, right through to commercialization. And I recognize that the BRAIN initiative has been quite strong in, in trying to pull all these parts together, but what do the others see in terms of our need for funding? Is, all, is the money going to be enough to achieve the goals that we want? And where, are we, where do we see gaps in funding? Well, I, I think when I think about my, my history, I, I spent over 20 years in the field of cancer and I moved recently into the field of neuroscience as a, as a CEO of a biotech company. And the contrast is so stark in terms of the amount of funding coming into oncology research versus neuroscience. And I think, and as you, you commented on how many people are affected by diseases of the brain, and it's, it's true that there are many people affected by cancers and, and there are many different cancers, but for us to solve the diseases of the brain with the amount of resources coming in now, I, I think we're a couple of exponents short. We, it, it's truly remarkable to go to, to neuroscience meetings versus oncology meetings and just see the, even judging by, by a, a very prosaic number, the number of posters presented, the numbers of investigators present. When the funding isn't coming in, we can't fund great research and progress can't be made. So I, I think that the disease of the brain are very seriously underfunded. Did you want to add anything to that, Dr. Tiger? Or maybe yeah, I can ask a, a little bit more to that question, which is also not just the money challenge, but also how do we more effectively transfer technologies uh, to accelerate the development of drugs and of devices? Uh, what other obstacles are there to this process? Well. I will not give up on my chance to say that yes, no, uh, there is not enough funding. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, did you ever meet a scientist that say, I have enough? <laughs> but of course, in, if uh, it's uh, experimental science, then the cost of uh, equipment and consumables is very high and it's getting higher from year to year, like in medicine. Mm -hmm. If it's theoretical science, then you need as much brain power as possible because there you can look at it from different angles and to get all the answers and even to ask the questions. But as neuroscience is both experimental and theoretical, then of course you need more money. But it's more than that, as you say, because it's multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, and because it involves all the fields that you mentioned, and including also linguistic and philosophy mm -hmm. above all the, the life science and exact science and engineering, then there are two additional very costly factors. One is the training. It takes 50% times more to train a PhD student in neuroscience, in average, than in the classical sciences. And the other one is connectivity, because you don't have all this expertise in one place, not even in one continent. You have uh, a lot of uh, budget that you need for relocation, for, for sharing platforms, etc. We have in my university a device called MEG, M-E-G. It's like E-E-G, but M instead of uh, E. You know the E-E-G records the electrical activity of the brain, you know this picture. MEG records the magnetic fields induced by the electrical activity of the brain. It's very nice, it's non-invasive, can, we can do it on each other, we don't need experimentalists. And, but it costs $4 million and 400000 a year to operate it. So of course, you, there are only 40 of these in the world and we always have um, guests that are coming in order to make recording but also to plan the project. Currently we have someone from South Africa from uh, Russia and from, uh, from uh, France. 
But it's not, as you said in general, it's not only the cost of research, it's very tricky because it's also the ample time mm -hmm. that the young people has to invest in order to become a neuroscientist. And since they are very, they are multi-skilled and they also have computational skills, in that time they could have already two exits, you know, in high tech. So it's much more, uh, much more complicated than that. But I mean, I, I share the sacrifice of the time because really understanding how the brain works is for me and for many other people, the most intriguing question of the 21st century. I mean, we have a lot of questions we want to answer, but on that we know so little, so we really want to understand more than that. Can so I, this, yeah, go ahead. Oh. No, I, I was just going to pick up, I was going to pick up on something that Mina talks about, the problem of training and maintaining an exciting workforce, an excited young workforce. And I'd just like to say that I've been a, a neuroscientist since my first days of graduate school. And in some ways, this is the absolute most exciting time for new discovery in the brain, partially because of new technologies that have been developed and partially because of the new technologies that are coming online. So it's a phenomenal time. And at the same time that it's a phenomenal time and is drawing excitement in our young and our young students and we want to bring them into the field, it is a time of complete despair among a large fraction of our graduate students and postdocs. And more and more and more of them are leaving the field because, and this is all about money and jobs, so you know, the NIH and I think funding agencies and other places in the world are funding at such low levels that students now think there's no future for me. And so, you know, we have this ridiculous, you know, scenario right now, which is the most exciting time for brain research that I can remember. And we're losing the highest fraction of these really excited, talented people that I can remember. And that's all because of money. Yeah, and I, and I have to say, I mean, that's one, of the, that's one of the issues around talking so much about these big initiatives. There is so much excitement, but we then tend to think, great, brain science is looked after, there's enough money. And, and I think the point is that there's a whole pipeline of science that has to happen, even for those initiatives to work. And, and we have to always keep focused on the whole pipeline and not just feel that we've done enough uh, to support this field. So I think that's a really important point. Um, I'm going to go back to you, Dr. Tyker, because one of the biggest challenges that we have today is all the data that we're collecting, patient data and other types of data. And it's estimated that if we took all the data to um, map the whole human connectome, it would consume nearly half the world's digital capacity. So what do you think are some of the ways that we can meet the challenge of collecting, standardizing, storing, and then sharing large data sets? You're right. There is a great demand on the current uh, digital storage capacity. And the brain mapping projects are competing with, with weather services, with geological and earthquake uh, control, with, uh, with the CDC in Atlanta. And all of these are also buyers of storage. And not to talk about research, you know, in, in social sciences, transportation, the health system, all these are mega, mega storage needs. Not to talk about your photo albums and YouTubes that are also. <laughs> but to be honest, I'm not worried about data storage. Uh, it will grow with the needs. You remember in how the storage of data was in the 70s. I mean, what we had on our 2005 Nokia phones took a huge room in the 70s. Yeah. But what we have today on our smartphone is a skyscraper in New York. So the, the storage will grow with the need. The problem in big data is not the storing, it's rather the exploiting and recovering and understanding and searching and protecting the data. As long as the mathematical tools and, and analytic uh, models and, and search engines are not developed enough, we don't have to rush with the storage and, and, and block the system. I gave a public talk in the summer, so someone asked me, ah, you need to search, why don't you use Google search? So of course I was quite amused, because one of the search engines that Google is using is something that we developed in my lab in Israel for a PhD student that then moved 
to work with Go for Google, and we never patented it. <laughs> so, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, worried. I mean, uh, we come to this issue of patenting uh, soon. But what do we know on the, ma on the mapping of the brain now, before we have this huge demand to map all the brain? We know that there are 10 to the 10 neurons in the human brain. We know that every neuron is connected with about 10 to the 4 connectors to other neurons, which are called synapses. We know very well the structure, the anatomy, and the physiology of each single neuron, how the canals are going there, etc. We understand also what happens in a neuron during a synapse, when the electrical activity is moving from one, from one neuron to another. And we know about locations. We have some good idea about locations. You all know that if I lift my glasses with my right hand, then something is firing in my left hemisphere. But we don't know yet, before the mapping, big mapping project, we don't know yet how does the whole system work in the whole. And what really triggers a neuron to fire, and, or a group of neurons to fire? And we also don't know uh, what is the backup system. If we drank wine yesterday at the dinner, we lost few neurons. But there is a backup system. It's not that we come this morning and we don't remember our name. So there is a backup system. And all these things we really don't know. Linguistic is, I mean, we don't know anything. I say ma, I say me. You hear mommy and you think of the woman that gave birth to you. So this transfer of two sounds to a concept is the linguistic process. We don't understand it. But and other cognitive and emotional things. So we need to, to understand now the brain, you say. We have to map the brain, we'll understand it. But what I'm saying is that even after we have this big mapping project of the brain that so many countries and put put uh, energy and money into it, we will not have answers to, the, to those questions. We will not have answers. We will have a beautiful graph, 10 to the 10, and all this connection, etc. But we will not understand how does the brain works. And can I ask you a follow-up on the data, because that's my, my, my B, is, is the discussion now about open access platforms, because I think one of the most exciting things about collecting all this data is this move in science about making the data available. Uh, as, as openly as possible so that every scientist will have access to the data and may be able to develop hypotheses or see patterns that um, a small number of scientists who were controlling the data previously may not. Uh, what do you think are the legal and ethical implications of this? And do you see this as hopefully as I have about what it could mean to transform the way we do research? You said if I see it hopefully as you, actually I don't know what you what your very hopes are, I, think, I think it's very exciting. I don't mind that we'll have a debate. <laughs> uh, let's look at it from, from neuroscience. I mean, these things of open data, it relates to other fields, mm -hmm. but we are now in open science. Experimentalist is making uh, uh, an experiment and collect brain recording, data from recording from different devices, maybe two I mentioned, but other devices. And he it's big data nowadays. So he gives this data to a theoretician, it's expert on big data. Could be a mathematician, computer science from other fields. And the theoretician looks at it and try to come with, uh, with conclusions. What are the models? I can even say business model for transferring this data from the experimentalist to a theoretician. It can be sold. There are many sub-models. Uh, it could be patents, licensing, know-how. It can be sold. It can be given away to some theoretician he trusts. It can be a collaborative project that they work together on this uh, data. And then if something converges, then it's their both are own, own. And it can be what you said is open data. Just put it on the, on the web and everybody can use it. So I'm a theoretician, but let's see what experimentalists get from, all, from these four uh, models. In the first one, he gets some money. In the second one, he gets a thank you note. <laughs> In the third one, he has a chance that when the project comes to something, and anyhow, he has satisfaction, scientific satisfaction, which is one of the incentives for a, for a scientist. And he also gets a credit. Both of them are on that work. 
And in the fourth one, he gets nothing because he doesn't get money, doesn't get credit, doesn't get anything. So you can say that he gets a salary from the university where he works for, but if the only thing he gets, I mean, no money and also no credit, he gets the small salary you get at the university, he better move to the industry, work on short-term project, and get a high salary, and, and something with commercial value. So I think that the collaborative option, number three, is, is the best one. It's not only because it's the meeting of the minds, it's also, it's a two-way traffic. Because he gets the data, he works on it a little bit, he talks again to the biologist, the other guy is a biologist, he understands what is visible from biological point of view and what is not. It comes back and in the end they have a project or they don't have a project uh, together. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, for me very uh, clear, very clear that it will not bring much advance to, to, to humanity if we will just leave all this. Uh, I mean, scientists have little incentive nowadays have, with, all the, with all the temptations. I have a slightly different take on things. Um, I'm an experimentalist. Um, I think the, there are two impediments to making all data open, um, and I think those are solvable. Um, and I also feel like everything, all the research that has been done in my laboratory has been paid by either the NIH or the NSF. So you guys own my data as far as I'm concerned. In other words, it's not my data, it's the American public has paid for my, you know, has paid money to use my expertise and my expertise in training people. So I feel like it belongs to you. But that said, there are two problems with um, providing data just openly on the, on the web, and that is, most of us collect data in ways that are somewhat idiosyncratic, and so it's not clear that if I just were to give my raw data to anybody, that it could be interp that would it would be interpretable, and so that is probably the biggest problem, which is until we come up with, and which is why collaborating with someone solves those problems, because if you're working hand in hand with somebody else who's gonna be analyzing it, then it's interpretable. So I think a lot of what has been collected is in its raw form uninterpretable by other people. Okay. That said, I think we have to evolve towards better ways of archiving, annotating, producing the metadata that would make at least the somewhat processed data useful. Um, the other problem is a problem that Mina sort of alluded to, which is the incentive structure for promotion and success um, often encourages people to hold on to things. And those incentive structures may be useful for the individuals, but they're counterproductive for the field. So I think we're evolving, I think, as certainly all the people I know, we're evolving towards believing, and many journals are evolving towards requiring that data be made available after publication in some form. But there's still a third problem, and this is one that I think you'll all understand. Right now, there's been a great hubbub in the field about replication and what can be replicated and what can't be replicated, most notably in the cancer field and in behavioral sciences. And in my opinion, that the most important thing that has to be made openly available is the data, but more importantly, the code for the data analysis. Because if the data analysis code is there, and if there's a mistake in the code, someone will figure it out. So the data by itself is useless without the code for the data analysis methods. And I think we are all evolving towards believing that with publication, the some access to the real data and the data analysis code is necessary, if for no other reason to allow us to solve the replication problems. Mm -hmm. I wanted to continue about something, and it will also be an an might be part of it, might be an answer, that, of course, this issue is also connected to the patents issue. And uh, some scientists, like uh, yourself maybe, and other scientists are against patenting. But um, I was, I'm collaborating with a great neurophysiologist, uh, Abeles, in, uh, in Israel. And he's really very much against patenting. So at some point, we split it. We continue to work together on 
to understand how does the brain works. But the medical project and the applications I did by myself, I continued by myself, and I patented the license it, but it was also the demand of my PhD students that they wanted to have a certain company. The, the philosophy that you said, it came from NSF or NIH, and that's why it belongs to the, to the uh, public. There are three ways to do it. Uh, in uh, Germany, for example, all the, all the, um, all the, all the know-how and all the IP belongs to the government because the, the universities are, are government. Uh, in the United States, there are different models. I and mean, MIT gave everything to the researcher. He owns it. In Israel, we have an incentive uh, scheme. So we understand that if eventually the scientists will not go into it, will not get something out of it, his incentives are, are smaller. So we are sharing. We are sharing the, the profit. So a different model, 40, 60, or 50, 50. And that also one of the reasons that we have so many startups in Israel, because people are, are, are getting something out of it. We, there are many other reasons why, why we have, and there are many other models. But if you say that everything that was financed by the government belongs to the government, we will not have cure for Alzheimer, and we will not have many, many important, uh, significant uh, devices. You have to go the middle way. Yeah. I think the middle way of 50-50 or 40-60 is good. Of course, there's other issues. You have to release the researcher to be able to dedicate time to continue with the project from one to another. But I'm also happy that I think the collaborative model that I mentioned is also yours, because you yeah. said in other words than I say, that uh, you, the, the one that took the experiment, he knows how to handle it, and he knows if the data, and if he just put on the web, nothing good will come out of it. And people that work and collect, they want to know something. Right. I think that in, in our uh, business, I think we're moving, we, we blend the collaborative model, and obviously there are uh, discoveries that are, are patentable, but just to give you a concrete example, we've talked a, 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 you know, a lot about the, the theory behind it, but we, we're working in the field of a very rare dementia, frontotemporal dementia, in a rare genetic variant, and of course the genetic variant is discovered in academia, it's elucidated, but a therapy can't come un unless there's investment behind that. And the interesting thing about it is at a, at a University of Texas Southwestern, the researchers there tested all known drugs against that particular uh, genetic mutation. It causes a decrease in a particular protein called progranulin in the brain, and they wanted to elevate progranulin. And all known drugs, there, there was one that, did it, that raised progranulin fairly well. Its challenge was it didn't get into the brain. So... In our labs, then, our scientists then start looking and making the chemistry of that type of molecule, but make it brain penetrant. And that then becomes a, a project that's now in, in clinical trials in, in patients to try to make their brains make more of that protein and potentially prevent the dementia. So there is the, the collaboration, there's the generation of knowledge that comes out of, of these experimentalists and the, the collaborating with the theorists, that, but then it has to be pulled through with all the um, regulation that's required for building new medicines that are going to be given to you know, a small handful or millions of people around the world. And, and that takes a business and it takes, it takes the funding of a business and central to the funding coming into that are the patents around it. So I, I think there's room for all kinds of models um, at all kinds of different points in time um, of innovation. But I think we're all agreeing that more of this needs to happen. We need more scientists, they need more funding, because the brain is a frontier that really has not been understood and tapped yet. May I ask a question? In understanding the brain and unlocking human potential, um, I know, for instance, my daughter-in-law has a meningioma that's not operable. And, of course, we all, my father had Alzheimer's, et cetera. So 
What I would like to know from Dr. Martyr is uh, where are we with some of these, uh, you, you've had this uh, special uh, brain initiative, where are we, where are we coming up with some of the things that might be of help to us? Well, I'd, I'd like to say that, you know, we've been doing brain research in this country for many, many years. There are some neurological disorders that, we're, we, that people have made enormous strides with. Um, Forty years ago, if you were diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, it was a really bad diagnosis. Today, if you're diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, the prognosis is much, much, much better, largely coming out of a, a number of drugs that were developed in many of them in Boston, um, that means that, you know, an MS diagnosis is far, far, far less disturbing on average than it was many years ago. We have better drugs for, um, for pain management today than we, for chronic pain and neuropathic pain, than were available um, a number of years ago. There are certainly better diagnostic measures for many things, but you know, as, as Inez said, there are a thousand, NINDS is responsible, that's the National Institutes of Neurological Disease and Stroke, is responsible for doing the basic science, the translational work, and helping towards the clinical um, discovery for a thousand brain disorders. So a thousand brain disorders means lots and lots and lots of different kinds of basic science is going to be necessary to start developing the therapeutics of all kinds for those. But that said, I think um, things have changed a lot, but I think we're fooling ourselves to think that someone's gonna come up with a magic pill tomorrow that's gonna solve Alzheimer's for anybody you know who's already affected. I mean, you know, hopefully, in 10 years, things will be better than they are today, but we really don't understand a lot of the basic biology that is important for neurodegenerative disease and for brain development. And you know, sometimes we'll be lucky and someone will accidentally stumble on something with great therapeutic potential. Sometimes you'll get therapeutic potential because of a real basic science discovery, but at the end of the day, we really don't know enough about the cell and molecular biology of the brain, both early in development and through lifetime, to really know how to think intelligently and carefully about many of those thousand disorders. Yeah, I could just support that and, and say that one of the interesting things for me, having spent many years in cancer and seen a huge advance and in coming into neuroscience, I feel like we're at, at an inflection point in that neuroscience area that we maybe were at in cancer potentially a decade or 15 years ago, where the basic biology, and that's why I'm so excited about the, the, the work that you're doing, is being picked apart now, as we did in the cancer cell. And the cancer cell is much less complicated than the brain. But we finally understood at a molecular level what is going wrong in some, some cancers, not all, um, unfortunately, men meningioma isn't one that we fully understand. But that allowed, that basic biological molecular understanding allowed new therapeutics to be generated that could attack that. And in the neurodegeneration, I talked about frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease, we're at the beginning of making progress. Yes, there are, we know in familial Alzheimer's, we know a couple of genes that if you have them, are, put you at much, much higher risk, and they're transmitted through families. But unfortunately, only a very, very small percentage of Alzheimer's patients actually carry the gene. But as we understand more about that, that it's, it's like pulling a thread. It starts to unlock more and more understanding. And meanwhile, basic understanding of other uh, connectivity principles in the brain, other biological processes in the brain are coming together. And eventually those things will converge. So to me, I feel very optimistic that in the decade ahead, we will see material progress. And you're right, there is no, no pill that will be available immediately for people with Alzheimer's disease. 10 years from now, that might not be 
as true, and maybe it won't be a pill. Maybe there'll be, there'll be a gene editing technique that'll be used for people who have a risk. We don't know, but I think we're at, a, at an inflection point where we could make significant progress. I'm not surprised that uh, our friend couldn't wait for the Q&A with Alzheimer. Alzheimer is really the, the one disorder, that uh, disease that is really interesting everybody. When I was uh, as, um, raising funds to put the brain center uh, at my university, I realized that a lot of the prospective donors uh, that's what they are worried about. And one of them was very direct to me. He said, I, I most of, I, he said, if you promise me that in 10 years there is cure for Alzheimer, <laughs> then I give you all the rest of the money that you need to finish the, to finish the building. So I said, that was, 10, that was uh, 12 years ago. So I said, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I cannot do it. So I went back to my president and I said, you know, that's what this guy this guy uh, said, he had a big chain of hotels uh, uh, in Israel, in the UK. And uh, that's what he said. So you should, uh, so he tells me, you should have told them that will be, uh, we will find a cure to Alzheimer. I said, we will not find a cure to, to Alzheimer. Anyhow, the poor, I realized that people are so afraid of it, especially these people that have so much uh, means, because they lose control. And the one thing you really enjoy when you have a lot of money is that you control all these people. But with Alzheimer, you lose control. So that's what the, the one thing they really... Finally, he did develop Alzheimer and he already died. <laughs> one of the questions that, of course, we all get asked the most often is, we're making these discoveries, we read about these big breakthroughs, but how come we're not getting fast enough to something that's actually going to help people? And there has been a lot of press around pharmaceutical companies reducing their investments in the brain area because of costly trials that have failed. Do you see a reversal of that now? Are you more hopeful, Dr. Dunsar? And also, are, what are the particular challenges in the brain area that are different uh, to what you've experienced in the cancer world? How long have you got? <laughs> um, so I, I think there has been a lot of stories about pharmaceutical companies reducing their investment in in. Uh, research of mental diseases and diseases of the brain. But when you add it all up, the investment has been over $100 billion in the last 10 years have gone into things like Alzheimer's research. And there have been many failures, but in those failures are the seeds of new learning. So, for instance, you've heard about potentially the antibody therapies in Alzheimer's disease, and they're supposed to remove the, the amyloid plaque. And some of those early, early antibodies, they were tried and they, they failed, but in a certain population, it looked like they may have a bit more success. But one of the things that came out of the, that work was an understanding that of people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, about a third of them in these trials didn't have the protein, the beta amyloid protein that creates the plaques in people's brains, in their brains. They had dementia, but it wasn't necessarily Alzheimer's. But there'd never been really a need to discriminate among dementias because there wasn't any differential therapy if you had a different type of dementia. So as these trials failed and the understanding of why they failed came to light, we now know that if you're going to test an amyloid therapy, you have to have a diagnostic to find out if there's amyloid in the brain. And now there is one. And that's new in probably the last seven years, I'd say, five to seven years. It's not even routine yet, but it's becoming more routine. So the diagnostics and the therapeutics can start to come together. And those drugs that failed, at least a couple of them are now moving forward with the diagnostics, so they're going to be tested in people who really have the disease that they can help. And so out of the seeds of those failures, new hope, new learning um, is born. But they're very expensive failures. So those pharmaceutical trials will have cost those companies probably close to a half a billion to 750 million just in outside costs never mind in the opportunity cost of what else that money could have been doing. And so I think what companies have said is, perhaps we'll step away until the biology is better understood and we can feel like we're targeting things better. 
And that's why I think the basic understanding of the molecular biology and the genetics, um, as, as well as understanding the circuitry of the brain and how, th how those connections are made and how those processes are really working at a molecular level is going to be so important for the industry then to be able to say, okay, now we know why we would test a particular drug or design a particular drug in a particular way. So I think the investment's actually coming back now. And I should say that NIH has a, a new big, big push in what they're calling precision medicine, which is their term for, for basically learning how to use genomic data from individual patients to properly sort people into different groups that will allow you to, to make much more informed decisions about what kind of therapeutics are likely to work, whether that's in terms of high blood pressure or diabetes or Alzheimer's or anything. And I think between you know, you are a wild type population. That is to say, there are all sorts of different genomic, uh, you know, realities. And what we are going to be heading forward to in the next 10, 15, 20 years, or everybody will have, you know, sequence data. And we will be able to look with a lot more knowledge than today and say, this person is much more likely to benefit from this therapy, and that person with what looks like the identical disease is not likely to benefit from that therapy, but will benefit from a different therapy or won't benefit at all. And I think the problem in clinical trials is without that kind of information that allows you to sort people into different classes, you might have the fabulous therapy for 20% of the population, and the trial will still fail because all the data are lumped together. Mm -hmm. That's can I ask you a little bit more specifically about mental illnesses? Because I think we talk a lot about Alzheimer's, but we have been treating mental illnesses with virtually the same type of medication um, for a very long time, and there hasn't been a lot of hope of new possible therapies. And I know mm -hmm. that there's some work that you're doing with Forum and schizophrenia in particular. Could you talk a little well, bit about that? You know, it, it, it's been so exciting for me, and, and this gets to something you were talking about, I think, Dr. Taikit. The, the, the systems in the brain, the circuitry of the brain, controls different processes across disease states. So for instance, cognition, the ability to learn, remember, and to organize thought is controlled by various systems and circuits within the brain that are not fully understood, but we understand them a bit better. So when we're looking at a therapy for Alzheimer's disease, you might be looking at one that treats the proteins that aggregate in the brain, or you might be treating what do those proteins do to the brain, which is impair memory. So we have a, a oral small molecule, you take it as a pill, that addresses enhancing the signals for cognition, for learning and memory. And we test that not only in Alzheimer's disease, but in other diseases where cognition is impaired. And schizophrenia is one of those. When you think of schizophrenia, I'm, I know you'll all be immediately thinking about the psychosis, the hallucinations, the, the delusions that people with schizophrenia are known to have. And there are therapies to treat that, not that they're perfect by any means, but there, there are quite a number of them. But there's never been anything to treat the cognition impairment that all schizophrenics face that precedes their diagnosis of schizophrenia, which, remember, comes on in late adolescence and early adulthood, right when people are finishing their education and beginning their work life and their independent life. And think about your cognition and how that is central to your ability to be educated, to work, to be independent. And there's never been a therapy to address that cognition decline in schizophrenia. And this medication potentially can by, again, addressing the circuits that are responsible for memory and learning, but not the underlying cause of schizophrenia. So it's a, it's a different way of approaching disease. And I think in the diseases of the brain, this interconnectivity and understanding how the circuits work will help us understand basic processes that go across disease types 
Um, and that's been a very exciting foray for us. And we'll have data on that um, agent addressing learning and memory and executive function in schizophrenia in the first quarter of next year. And that could be the first ever therapy for addressing that issue for schizophrenics. And I'd, I'd love to hear your comment, because I, I was so interested in, in your talking about understanding those connections and systems in the brain. Have you done any work in those yeah. areas? Yeah. I'm working on epilepsy, for example. So uh, I'll just say that and then I'll answer what you say. Epilepsy uh, is uh, influencing 4% of population. I mean, we didn't know that. I mean, it means one over 26 uh, has some kind of epilepsy. It could be very, very um, mild one that suddenly you lose contact for a while and it happened just once and it can be the very bad one that it means you get the whole brain is under under circuit and then if you look at it and brain recording it's total black not like, like the wave used to look and in that case uh, we are really doing a lot of works and mathematics is very helpful we are mm -hmm. taking these recordings and what we are doing with mathematics we are detecting the epileptic focus of the place where there is the scar that causes all this problem. Uh, if the patient is really very affected, it means that the, um, the number and the strengths of the attacks are, are very uh, are high, then at the end he can only stay at home because otherwise he falls and dies from that. So when that comes, even before that you take medication, but 30% of the people that take medication, the medication doesn't help. So in that case, you have to go into the brain. Of course, you want to do it as small as possible. So the damage later will be much smaller. And there, there are uh, different ways that the, the neurosurgeon and, and the neurologist, they imagine where it is. But really, the computational models that mm -hmm. exist and those that we, uh, that we develop give them a hint, and then at the end they go there, they take a little piece, and we test if we were right, because if later the attacks disappear or, or they are very rare, and also the people are still functioning all the way they are doing. Um, what you said about uh, schizophrenia and, and, um, and cognitive system, so we are testing, we are testing different cognitive system, uh, not so much uh, on, uh, on schizophrenia people because as we say, we don't really understand cognitive system even for healthy person, so we don't do. But what we do about sick, we don't do the research on humans, but we do it on rats. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we infect the rats with, I mean, it might be not so politically correct, but you cannot really develop a cure for, for humans without trying it on animals first. So we do uh, animals on depression and this algorithm that we developed for identifying the local uh, focus of the epileptic uh, of the, the epileptic focus was the same algorithm, genetic algorithm, was used later in order uh, to detect the depre detect depression and even some of it was we were curing uh, rats from depression. It's uh, you don't like rats, maybe, but when the rat is depressed, you, it's still a miserable. Cat. It's still, oh my God. By the way, by the way, this uh, epilepsy, this epilepsy research had an unbelievable application to another field, uh, which you don't expect, but that's science. You you do something. Uh, that, this attack, when there is attack, why is it important to locate it? I'll explain because you don't want to take too much out of the brain. But it's also important to get advance notice on, on, on the tech. Because really, most of the people are die young, not because of the, the epilepsy, but because they fall and they, they hit their head somewhere. So you want to have, and we never thought that this is going to be useful for mathematical finance. Till the 2008 crisis came, and people started to say, well, we, we couldn't know it. How did it emerge? Oh, all the bad things happened for so, so long time. Why suddenly? Everything collapsed. And these are well, the same words we are using when we do this epilepsy, because the person is there, everything is OK, and suddenly this whole brain is, is, it looks like, uh, like uh, black. Of course, there is the focus, etc. but how to get this advance notice? So we're adapting now 
the, the uh, algorithm, the genetic algorithm for um, detecting the epileptic focus and advance notice to financial markets. So this is a very, uh, very hot, very hot, uh, very hot research. And people say, people are joking with me. Of course, you'll tell me before, if you see something before. I said, no, I'm not, first of all, I'm not saying any, anybody. There's just one, you know whom I'll say? I said, I'm only telling it to my IWF girlfriends. <laughs> So before we get to the questions, uh, let me just ask for some closing thoughts from you about where you see the field heading over the next decade and what kind of hope we can expect. And I also want you to touch a little bit on the whole notion of enhancement because this session was titled Unlocking the Human Potential. And part of it was thinking about can we be developing for the future a drug uh, to improve memory or to enhance other functions for people who are otherwise healthy. So I'll start, why don't I start with you, Dr. Dunsar, and we'll move in this direction. So where do I, I said we're at an inflection point. I think the understanding of the genome, the, con, the connectome in the brain, the molecular biology of the brain will allow us to develop therapies for those who are sick. When it comes to enhancement, I think that's going to be a, a societal question we need to address. I can look at the drug we're developing for learning, memory, and executive function in schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease, and I never, ever go to a cocktail party, to an investor meeting, or anywhere where the, somebody doesn't say to me, can I get some? So, and I say, get in line behind me. Um, but it speaks to the, to the question of, okay, what, what would healthy people do with with such an agent available, and that's just a, a, a teeny bit of, I think, what, what the bigger question you're asking is, and as we think about the area of gene editing, which is a very topical uh, conversation now as we use the CRISPR-Cas9 systems to take out pieces of genes that are bad and potentially replace them with pieces of genes that will do the right thing, what's, what's going to stop us as a, as a human race from changing things we just don't particularly like. And whose definition of not particularly liking something are we going to use in that? And I think those go well beyond the basic scientists, um, even the physicians. It goes to the ethicists and, and um, leaders of our society and the thinkers and the philosophers of our society. That I, But we will have to wrestle with these questions as a society in the next, I would say, decade? So I have two answers to that, and that is beware the law of unintended consequences. Um, and so for those of us who are old enough, we can remember our, the experts doing double and triple flips about any number of things, whether it's HRT to produce beneficial effects in you know, cardiovascular or brain function, and how many times we've gone around in circles on that, I mean, for, or what statins do or don't do, et cetera. So, but that said, our students are already, the number of students who are taking cognitive enhancers already is enormous. Um, I don't want to think about what fraction of students take Adderall. You know, maybe it's been diagnosed, maybe it's their cousin's, you know, prescription. Uh, maybe it's been trafficked on the streets. Um, how many people are still smoking? And, you know, nicotine is a really good cognitive enhancer. Um, and yeah, it works. It makes people focus your attention. I mean, that's why people like to smoke. It is also very addicting, and it also has a terrible drug delivery problem. So, I mean, but it's not the nicotine that's the problem. It's the, it's the drug delivery mechanism, which has been so bad. So, I mean, we've been doing cognitive enhancements forever. I mean, and nicotine may be one of the best I can think of for certain kinds of activities. Um, but again, we have the law of unintended consequences. So, and I would really, for those of you who have children and grandchildren, you should ask them how many of their friends are taking Adderall. Um, I, I, I suspect it's a third. It's really much higher than people realize. I mean, you, I, terrible or not, I mean, maybe, and not always, but maybe, and they, they, they share their pills 
Um, so don't, don't be surprised. So I don't know. I think we're already there. Uh, I think we're already there and we haven't acknowledged it. I see, I divide it to timeline. So I see in 20 years that th there is a cure for, for Alzheimer and there is a cure uh, for, uh, for epilepsy. And I see in 20 years that artificial intelligence is much more improved because we understand the brain better. But it's met and also, but it's matter of motoric more. So robotics will be much more advanced. And maybe vision and maybe hearing. So even now we already have some devices that a deaf person can get the the recording directly to the brain without moving through the ear, and we'll have some improvement on, on vision, but not so much, because vision is much more uh, complicated. You know that face recognition, for example, we st no computer can do is ad as good as we do it. You know, when we look at a person, even if he's sad or not sad, different uh, hairstyle, it's a cultural thing. In the brain, for example, the face recognition is in the different hemisphere from shape recognition because of this culture. So the computers are not that good and we have to understand better the face recognition in order to do it. So all these little things, we will get advanced in 20 years. But will, shall, will, will we understand how does the brain works? The question that I put before, the system as a whole, the, the backup system, the, the cognitive, the emotional, we will not understand the rules how all these machines are working. And if uh, Newton finds out that the distance is time multiplied by the speed, this simple formula, we still don't have it for the brain. And we will not have it for 20 years. We, it will take a century before we understand how does the brain works, and it's not in our lifetime, even the younger here. Right now, there is certainly a lot of a growing, inc an increase around kids with ADHD, sometimes diagnosed or misdiagnosed. So my question is sort of like, what is happening around ADHD? And certainly the second question is, um, I just, I forgot around ADHD. Um, uh, uh, oh yes, and uh, right, I have a drug maybe I have too. ADHD. The second one is what is being hap what's happening around diagnosis around ADHD? Because everywhere I hear, there are really no specific things that can be done from an assessment perspective. Well, all of our universities think they know because I, we get all these students with an increasing number of students in our classes have letters saying yeah, that they have, yeah. that's the definition, that they need time and a half or two times for their exams because they've got a, you know, a diagnosis of some kind of learning disability. So, you know, all I know is between now and 20 years ago, the prevalence has way, way increased. It's mainly a rich, the, it's the rich people uh, disease because they can go to get a letter from the psychiatrist. <laughs> so I, I don't mean to trivialize this. I mean, I, it's, I think this is a really, really, really thorny problem. That diagnosis is being properly or improperly used more and more and more and more commonly in our upper middle class or middle class or whatever well, American culture. Elementary wise, that's being diagnosed in first or second grade. Right, and then the question is, you know, are these kids being put on Ritalin and, and Adderall and what are the long-term consequences of that? And yes, it makes them more manageable, but who knows what it's doing to brain development. I mean, I think this really falls into um, I think the biggest ethical conundrum that I know of, you have a 12-year-old and they're suffering in school and in their lives and then you say, are the unintended consequences of taking the drug more or less problematical than the benefits that you can actually see and how do you, you know, is it ethical to deprive them of that drug if you think they'll be able to do better in school or is it ethical to give them a drug that you know is likely to change their brain development. On the other hand, if there's something wrong and you can change their brain development for the better, you know, so I go around in endless circles with this and, you know, I'm sure there are people who can take any position. I could argue either side of this. Um, and I do with my classes every year when I teach neuroscience. I have this discussion with my students because it's one that they are facing and that their, their families are facing and people are facing it. Now, 
presumably those people were in the population 60 years ago when we were students, but people probably just thought of, well, troublemakers, right? What about um, autism? Because the ratio, um, I think, is 1 in 68 now, and with boys, 1 in 42. So I didn't hear any mention of that today. And I feel like it's, it's, the ratio is changing so quickly that it, what, is there enough being done, do you think? And what about like non-pharma solutions? Because I, I'm personally concerned about the long-term effects. of. So there's that. a tremendous amount of um, attention going to autism today. I mean, there is probably the patient advocate groups, the funding mechanisms, the private foundations, the Simons Foundation has dumped and is dumping enormous amounts of money, um, and Gates has actually started dumping enormous amounts of money into work on autism. Um, the problem there, and there's, it's probably a very, it's very promising, is you know, to what extent can you develop animal models that replicate some of the phenotypes that then you can use to develop the basic science understanding of what's going wrong and then hopefully move towards therapeutics. I think most everybody thinks that the problem in autism is, you know, a develop, sort of developmental problem of circuits. So that's why understanding basic circuit function becomes so critical. Um, and I think there's so much tension right now that, that things are going at the basic level about as fast as they can go. But it's not going to be tomorrow. It might be in 10, 15 years. We talk about the spectrum now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, of it's, and it's a spectrum. spectrum. How much transparency is there in the privately funded research? In other words, do other companies know, the, do, you, do the public uh, researchers know what, uh, what the others are doing, what they're learning, what failed, mm -hmm. and uh, I assume that if they come up with a good drug, then everybody mm -hmm. knows, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to find out if there's duplication. And, yeah. uh, I think just commenting on, on it what? from the, the pharmaceutical side, there is a, a, a big initiative to make sure all results get published because for many years it was positive results got published and scientific journals are much more prone to publishing positive things than, than negative things, but we learn from the negative too. So there's, there is a, I think, increasing transparency and I think you, you refer to it maybe, Eve, the, the use of data and the availability of data um, from trials that have been on, ongoing and approved. There's, a, there's another uh, big push to make that data available so that there can be more learning from it. And navigating that and making sure that um, patent rights are protected and things like that are, is important, but it, there is a push to more transparency. There is an in economical incentive to the big farmers in order to... They, I mean, they invest so much money in, in the Killian trial to get an FDA approval. So, of course, they make sure that as many doctors as they know will know about it. And the internet, now everybody is a little bit of a doctor with the internet. Yeah. But actually, I think many um, pharmaceutical companies today are encouraging um, more early work to be publicly available and to be shared because mm -hmm. The dollars come at the very last stage. So slowing down the development of all the preclinical, the translation and the preclinical work, slowing that down for IP reasons is actually counterproductive. So I think most companies have become much more open. Um, and then the real last push, which is developing the actual product, that's where privacy will, will come into play. But I think everybody is playing in a much more open field now. I have a two-pronged question. One part is, that I'm glad somebody brought up the subject on autism. Um, one part of the question is, we, we, know, we all know that autism is tremendously on the rise. We don't know what's causing it, what's causing genetic fragility, et cetera, and what are the causes of that? But in children that are seemingly normal, that around maybe two years of age, they suddenly turn and their brains then completely kind of go haywire and they regress. And w in terms of research, mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the factors maybe causing some of that? 
And the second part of the question is, in Asperger's, where certain parts of the brain are so brilliant in terms of unlocking potential, where, the, where they can compute mathematically mm. amazing things or create the brain that creates music in such amazing uh, ways. Is, uh, are there any studies about tapping that understanding to, un to understand the potential that lies dormant, I guess, in all of us? Wow, that's a big question. I'm going to leave it to the experimentalists to take that one. Remember, every brain is different. I think the real, real, um, you know, every person in this room has a different brain. Now, I know that all of you have functioning respiratory centers because you're all breathing. And presumably most of you are seeing to some degree, but the structure of your visual cortex is going to be different. I mean, one of the really, one of the things I study is individual variation. How many properties can vary in a circuit and still have a circuit be reproducible and reliable? So I think what we really, really, really don't yet have is a science of individual difference, which is going, which is starting to arrive now, and many of those questions are gonna be necessary to understand that. Just because someone, someone over there can do a fabulous job of learning a new language and someone over there can't, doesn't mean that that brain could do it. It just means that that brain is actually different from that brain. Uh, there was a mention yesterday by one of the speakers, and you read things in the non-scientific press about the connection between the gut and various brain disorders, so autism or other types of brain disorders. Would you just comment if you have any opinion or if there's any research that supports those type of things? Well, right now there's a tremendous push to understand what's called the microbiome, microbiome. which is the to understand better the full molecular um, composition of all the bugs living in your gut. So it's very clear that the microbiome and the other functions of the gut can cause a release of many, many hormones that can go right back to the brain. In fact, many brain active hormones are produced both in the gut and in the brain. So, you know, the gut writ large um, definitely can influence brain function, nervous system function, spinal cord function, peripheral nervous system function. So I think it's a really exciting time um, because the, the brain-gut axis, the gut-brain axis is really a new area of research. Well, thank you very much. I know this is a broad topic, but we are learned so much today from these three panelists. Well, these leaders want their communities to be prosperous and peaceful, right? So their aim primarily is to reduce conflict within their community, and most conflicts tend to be about land.